Welcome to Two Dope Chicks Podcast with your hosts, Bree and Kim. What's up and welcome to today's edition of Two Dope Chicks, aka 2DC. I'm Kim. And I'm Bree. And as always, we have a very special show lined up for you guys. And without further ado, Bree, let's get popping. All right, you guys. Today we have a phenomenal guest for you today. Uh, actor, producer, director, public speaker. Welcome to the show, Mike Anderson. Everybody give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me too, Goat Chicks, Kim and Bree. I appreciate <laughs> you all. Welcome to the show. Hey, welcome to the show. Now, you have a very interesting story where you were facing the death penalty, and I believe you also served out a 17 and a half year life sentence, only to then come back to become an award-winning film producer. That's amazing. I'm just, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. And yeah, I always um, say it's, it's all God. It's all God. <laughs> I mean, that's an awesome story, and we thank you for bringing that story here to Two Dope Chicks to DC. Um, but right now, we want to know a little bit about what led you on your path to serving that sentence, um, if you can divulge that information for us. What happened? What were you convicted of or falsely accused of? I don't really know the story yet as far as that. Sure. I actually, um, when I was a teenager back in the uh, late 80s and, and uh, 90s, 1990, I actually was... Uh, Getting involved with a lot of things, dealing with criminal uh, life, street life, you know, um, dealing with selling drugs and also selling weapons, selling guns, firearms and stuff. And my first charge in 1990 was a charge that involved a second degree murder that happened at a, a party um, after the high school that I had graduated from had a homecoming game. There was a party that followed that after the homecoming game. And one of the guns that I actually sold to somebody uh, was used at that party that night. And since I was the person that was last seen with that gun from a witness that actually was involved with the first case that I'm talking about, that was a witness, they saw me with this gun, but the gun had been sold prior to the shooting. And so when the murder happened, being that the witness was somebody that wasn't even involved with the party or nothing, there was like a a uh, second party person outside of the case uh, because I was selling guns and they just happened to see that particular gun in the back of my car as well. They went ahead and reported that they felt like it was me. So I got picked up for a second degree murder. But as I came home on that second degree murder charge that I didn't do and I wasn't snitching, I wouldn't run my mouth and tell them who it was that I sold the gun to, who it was that I knew to who I did it. I mean, I was at the party that night. So they of course put me at the party. I didn't have an alibi that said I, I wasn't at the party, so that made me even look even guiltier. So as I was out on bond, they kept coming at me, you know, trying to say, hey, we heard there's some foul play going on here now, but if you let us know what's going on, then we could take these charges up off of you. And, you know, me being the dude that I was, real loyal to the streets and not wanting to even run my mouth, I was the type of person, you know, don't snitch. So I didn't. But while I was out there, I did the dumbest mistake of staying in the streets, I felt like my life was over with. Hey, here I am charged with a crime that I didn't do. I know they're going to pin me some kind of way. I'm going to get some kind of time. I'm already in these streets. So stay out in the streets. Stayed out in the streets. Kept hustling, selling drugs, selling guns. And before you know it, seven months later, a major, situ a major situation happened. So by the age of 18, 19, 18 and 19, I was facing the death penalty plus life, plus 60 years. Wow. I had second degree murder, first degree murder, and attempted murder. I waited in jail for three years waiting for trial till they finally came at me and said, look, if you want to escape the death penalty and not get executed, you're going to have to take a plea bargain for life. So I took a plea bargain for life just to escape the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most people would have probably yeah. chosen. And I was young. <laughs> yeah, I was young and afraid. You know, my, I didn't want to lose my life. And, you know, I, you know, I had a little brother that really, really looked up to me and then my mom, you know, it probably would have crushed her. Right. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to put my hands into the, into the, to the hands of the, my life into the hands of the system. Yeah. That would have been a horrible thing to do. Now, um, real quick, what state was this in? North was Carolina. This? Okay. North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. So, so, and I know you have, um, 
a, a, a really um, inspiring story as far as where, you know, where you came from. But I kind of want to flash forward into, you know, when you got out, you got into the film industry. How did that happen? Did you always have a passion for the film industry? Was it always a passion of yours or did that develop while you were serving time? It's crazy. Just it, I have to flash back now while you flash forward. <laughs> 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 With that being said, when I was in the streets and, you know, first started out, you know, selling crack and stuff like that, uh, a crack fiend had came up and came up with one of those old school cameras that you put the whole VCR tape in mm -hmm. and um, everybody was laughing at him. I'm like, man, get out of here with that. And I'm looking at him like, nah, 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 come here, come here. Let me see that. So he comes towards me with the camera and I end up giving him, you know, Two, two quarter rocks for it and I took the camera was playing around with it just was fascinated by it then turned around and filmed a little short fake karate movie with my my, my friends out there and um you know and just kind of like playing with the camera once in a while filming things doing st filming stuff with my little <laughs> brother and then doing other things but then after I became incarcerated of course that camera wasn't in my hand anymore uh -huh. But while I was on the inside, I would always catch myself kind of like, you know, having a sense of urgency to have that camera in my hand. And I trans I transferred it to writing while I was in there. And I just started writing, doing a lot of writing. I was writing poetry. I was writing plays. I spent 17 and a half years in there. I, I, I searched myself and dug deeper and deeper inside of me and found out that, yo, I'm a writer, I'm a, I'm a performer. You know, we put, I put some of the plays on in prison for other right. inmates to watch and had some of the inmates involved and then just kept writing and writing and writing and just performing and doing talent shows and everything. I mean, even I had a rap group where we won five years in a row and we called it the prison Grammy. <laughs> well, we won five years in a row and I mean even Big Tigger was talking about me on Rap City and showing my oh, trophy wow. on Rap City so um, then when I got out in 2008 and I was coming out to Kroger and I bumped into a familiar face and I said yo Play what's up and it happened to be Christopher Martin Play from Kid and Play so uh, he was like oh man he's like what are you doing now I was like well Working with my boy, we got a restaurant, you know, going to try to start and open up a, another a new restaurant. And he's like, yo, I do this thing called Brand News. I want you to come, you know, holler at me if you're interested. He uh, gave me the address. You know, it took a while because I was getting familiar with cell phones, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he had to text me the address and texted me the address and then took me into his whole outfit and operation and then started using me as a journalist, uh, a news reporter for Brand News TV, and then also put the camera in my hand one day when I had to film for him at a, a music conference that we had for Radio One. And I just started filming and I realized I needed that camera back in my hand right. because I felt great and I knew this was my route. I knew it right. was my route. Yep. So once he put that camera back in my hand, I went to, I graduated from YTU and GU which is YouTube University and Google University. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I took myself to school and started learning the angles and everything I needed to do and just kind of like taught myself and taught myself a little bit of editing and just threw myself out there into the arena. And before you know it, I was being pulled into different projects. One thing led to another. I started shooting music videos. And then I got pulled into another project. I pulled into the Ferguson documentary that was on BET. Mm -hmm. um my some of my footage was in that i was a cinematographer for that and then i started being given bigger projects i shot my short film in 2011 my first one it was called stray which is showing truth reaching all youth that's the acronym it was about a bullet mm -hmm. stuck inside the head of a drug dealer won a lot of awards for that at, at uh, different film festivals and then i realized yo this is the direction you need to go and then i even jumped into the acting arena because i remember I caught the acting bug when I was in kindergarten. I played Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in the play. <laughs> so uh, ever since then, I knew I had it. Yo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's, an important, uh, that's an important character. <laughs> yeah, it is. He's the misfit. And I, I related to him because I was like a misfit growing up. You know, I was always like a misfit. I was the black sheep out of the family, uh, the black sheep out of the hood, grew up in a domestic violence plagued household, and always felt ashamed when I went to school because 
every day or every night ended in my father, you know, beating the hell out of my mom, a lot of screaming going on, the cops coming to the house. So I felt like a misfit. I felt like Rudolph with the red nose. Right. You know, I, just, but, you know, I knew that was a gift also inside of me, like <laughs> there was in Rudolph. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went into acting too. And I started getting picked for TV shows on TV one and on ID. And then one thing led to another, ended up in a movie with Vivica Fox. And then, then ended up playing a lead role for this TV show that shoots down in Atlanta called Music and Murder. And one th again, one thing led to another with that. And that, that became a, a, a pastime for me. So. Yeah. Wow. All right. But I believed in myself, which was most importantly. I believed in myself. I knew I had the gift. And I knew I had an example, a new example to set. Right. for the at-risk youth because when I came home I also started uh, mentoring um, adjudicated youth and I got my own nonprofit. started doing gang intervention and once people started hearing about me I got picked up to do public speaking and then different people started reaching out to me uh, Barack Obama's My Brother's Keeper Speakers Bureau I got attached to that then I got attached to the Black Caucus meetings where I was out there speaking about mass incarceration and juvenile incarceration and mm -hmm. the school to prison pipeline. So I really got involved with that because that's still, that's my number one passion. You know, I never forget right. from where I came from. Um, well, I mean, I just personally wanted to know, um, now I, I, I see that you have, um, you, you wrote and produced your own biopic. Is that correct? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, I actually uh, wrote, shot, directed and produced my own biopic. And it stars uh, Joshua Gunn, who's a dope, dope, dope MC out of the Durham, North Carolina area. But he's he's been seen abroad under people like Damian Dash, MC Light, and all them. Um, okay. And he plays me, actually. <laughs> and then it's also starring uh, Hawthorne James, you know, Red from Five Heartbeats, um, Oba Baba Tunde, who plays uh, Shamar Moore's father yeah. on SWAT. He's he's he plays an agent that reached out to me from L.A. back in the day, and then got me to speak at the BET uh, Experience in um in Los Angeles. Uh, you got Shaw Jackson; she's in there. She plays one of my prison counselors. Um, oh, okay. You got yeah, you got Petri Bird in there, which is Bird from Judge Judy. He plays my the older version of my father. Um, my son, wow. my son plays me when I was young. Oh he wow! Did a great job. Yeah, he did a great job in that. Um, you know, and I'm quite sure when we take this break, people will be able to see the trailer. Okay, guys, we're going to take a quick look at the trailer, A Polished Soul by Mike Anderson. Look, we got orders to keep you in admin seg until one of your victims leave the yard. Yo, are you serious? Yo, come on, man. How long I gotta be in here, bro? Until you get out. I'm Jackie Butler. I'm a parole officer. It all started when I was little and in the hospital. And I almost died. And the devil came to visit me. And then my father introduced me to the almighty gun. Now, Mikey. Don't do nothing stupid, boy. After that, Life got crazy. Damn, slow as hell out here, man. Well, buck 50, I'll let you get this 38. Woo. What you gonna do with that old Glock? Oh, that's already spoken for. That's him. I got it. Mike Anderson. Hell yeah, nigga. Hey, you would have block been good to me, for real. Mike, turn around. Face away from me, put your hands in the air, nice and slow. Nice and slow, interlock your fingers. Somehow, I survived. The key is, know your blood, you know I mean? In other words, know your surroundings. Trust nobody. Mm, I've been watching you. You move a little different than everybody else. Guess that's a compliment. I see it, give me the banger. It could help you think a little bit different. My name is Mike Ray Anderson, and I am a polished soul. Hello. May I speak to Mike Anderson, please? 
Okay. Well, I also heard you're going to have a, um, be doing a red carpet. So uh, can you tell us or tell our viewers any additional details like, um, you know, where and when they can catch you on the red carpet? I'm sure it'll be somewhere probably around November. So what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. What's going to happen is, is we're going to, and this is all still up in the air, whether it's going to be at a, a, a brick and mortar venue or if it's going to be virtual because we're not sure, you know, what the situation is going to be with Corona still mm -hmm. in that part. And, you know, that's, that's flu, that's a uh, flu season and all, whatever virus season and all of that. Mm -hmm. So we're not, I, hopefully and prayerfully, we don't go through this second wave of what they say is two strains of Corona. But if we do, then it'll be virtual. And, 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 you know, I feel like, you know, we could pull off a virtual red carpet with no problem. That actually sure. might be a little bit more easier on the budget. <laughs> <laughs> ain't gotta worry, ain't gotta worry about no flights, no hotels, or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? And and everybody will hopefully have a red carpet in their house. I'll send them a strip. <laughs> if you like me, oh, I a strip of a carpet. Huh? If you like me, Rona needs to get the hell on. Like I, I've <laughs> I know, right? For her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has it has really dampened the industry a lot. And um, but at the same time, I'm gonna be honest with you. It leveled the playing field. Like, you know, some of us that you would have probably never heard of in the major theaters, you're going to hear about us in streaming now because we have content. And, you know, we're mm -hmm. producers that, you know, are, are have the same potential as your typical usual producers that you see in the theater. So nowadays, you know, it has leveled the playing field. It has given everybody a platform, you know, for everybody to turn into... The, the 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 George Lucas's or the Tyler Perry's, you know, Billy and Joe can now become the same thing, and which is a great thing, you know, it's a blessing. But there's always a gift and a curse with everything that comes. Um, how did you end up becoming a spokesperson? So can you tell well, us that? Yeah, yeah. As I, I was saying earlier, that um, I I had formed a nonprofit, uh -huh. and uh, the nonprofit is called. Polished Souls Foundation Incorporated. Polished Soul is something that came up in my head one night when I was in prison and I just came out of nowhere and just wrote this little itinerary for what I think I would do if I came home. And I first got interested uh, in speaking when I took Toastmaster classes in prison. Because mm -hmm. while, while I was inside for 17 and a half years, I didn't waste my time. I, I stayed in school 13 of those seven and 17 and a half years, got two college degrees, nine different vocational trades and took like also help yourself courses on the side and Toastmasters was one of them and when I found out I had the gift to speak I kind of was like yeah you know I like this and I became the spokesperson for the scared straight program on the inside and then I also became the spokesperson for the volunteer appreciation banquets so I would do all the speaking um, for inmates on, the, on behalf of the inmates and after all of that, when I came home, I had a few interviews that I did with the news. And so the interviews that I did with the news and not just the news, but different talk shows and stuff, different talk shows and stuff, I actually had a lot of things that um, people would seek out and then hire me for different speaking engagements at churches. Then after the churches, it kind of evolved into uh, Barack Obama's My Brother's Keeper Speakers Bureau black caucus meetings and then it started going to another national uh going to a national level and i was being targeted to be the speaker for mass incarceration juvenile incarceration and the school to prison pipeline awesome 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 um i just want to say to you you know thank you so much for blessing us with your story it's an amazing story and um you know i always like to tell people that life teaches the best lessons and I want to say to you that you're definitely a living testimony. Keep blessing people. Thank you for blessing us with this interview. And um, Bree, what do you got? For yeah. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, Kim said it perfectly. Um, life teaches you the best lessons. I, I always um, relate to that when someone said pregnant, you know, giving birth hurts. Well, you don't know until you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> until you know. Uh, <laughs> But, um, I can imagine it's like passing a kidney stone, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know but what? Hey, guys, we wanted, to, um, we wanted to let the viewers know that you have been so gracious. If you can hold up the um, autobiography that you have. Oh, sure. Um, this is my autobiography that some lucky viewer is going to get blessed with. Oh, an autographed copy of it. 
Um, and for those of you that don't get blessed with the autographed copy of it, you can find it on Amazon. It is a polished soul, the Mike Ray Anderson story. And it so, is available on Amazon. So basically, all you guys have to do is after you see the show, share it or repost it. And you guys are going to have to do three tags. Okay. So it's going to be hashtag Mike Ray, R A E Anderson, hashtag a polished soul and hashtag two dope chicks. The first two one we see chicks. to do this, two dope chicks. The <laughs> first person we see to do this, we are gonna give you this autobiography that's a signed copy from Mike Ray Anderson. All right. right. And, I, and I will definitely dedicate it to whoever the winner is. So once they find out who the winner is, I will sign it to you. Ooh. And then we'll get it going into transit to make sure you get it. And right. read it now. Don't put it on the shelf and let it collect mm -hmm. dust. So don't use it to kill flies or use it right. as a coat <laughs> or, you, or your beer or nothing exactly. like that. You read this book because I go yeah. all in on this. The movie, the movie is an embellishment. This right here, though, I let it all out from age six all the way wow. to, I mean, present day. So wow. Okay, how much did it go for on Amazon? Yeah. What happened? So I just Oh, I'm just saying, I want that book myself. I'm about to create an account. I'm about to hashtag like crazy. Maybe I'll win it because I need that book in my can't life. She? <laughs> oh, man. That's conflict of interest. You can't do that. Right. Damn, damn, damn. <laughs> damn. And for anyone who is interested in buying the book, um, how much does it go for? Do you know the price that they're selling it for right now? It sells on Amazon, I want to say between sixteen ninety five and eighteen ninety five, then you can get the e copy for like seven ninety nine, which is okay. a, a okay. Kindle copy. Yeah. Okay, I'm and uh, yeah, oh god. So look, hey, we are so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any shout outs? Anybody that you didn't mention that you want to go ahead and sure, put sure, sure. Man, I just want to shout out all the brothers and sisters on lockdown. Keep your head up. Your day is going to come. Um, stay positive, do positive things, engage in positive involvements. Um, and I want to give a shout out to all the people out there that think that regardless of how hard they fall, they can't get back up because in all actuality, you really, really can. And, I mean, you just got to, you got, you got to dig. Yeah. Dig deep inside of yourself. Find out who you are first. Yeah. And then that way you could come back and represent who you are in the best positive light. I like awesome, that. awesome words to live by. So yeah. um, we like to end our show, Mike, with um, a tiny segment called the Sippy Cup. Have you been drinking on anything today? Have you been sipping on anything while we've been talking? Even if have I been water. sipping on anything? Uh, no, I was yeah. just I was I was trying to I was trying to keep it professional. I could have, but not. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had my daily mimosa yet, but you know how that goes. But uh, okay, yeah. But, but no, I, I mean one of the things that I do start off my mornings with is at least three bottles of water, um, mm -hmm. natural spring water, and then after natural spring water, I have a tendency to you know. Uh, do my next two or three bottles later on. So I do a lot of water, but when it comes to my drink drinks, mm -hmm. when I want to relax, I'm a Tito's guy. I'm going to be honest. Tito! <laughs> That's what Tito's Tito. I'm sorry. Yeah. I got excited because that's my favorite <laughs> drink. And I like, I like a little um, Tito's with my orange juice. You know? That's what I'm talking about. Little... That's my mimosa. That's my mimosa. <laughs> I'm sorry. You just I like made a little, I like. I said that backwards. I like a little orange juice with my Tito. There just you go. A just a splash, bit. like a like the, the the guy that does that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. that's what I was sipping yeah. on. So Bri, oh wow. What about yourself? Um, I'm just you know I'm gonna keep it simple. A little Merlot, because really that's all I have. Merlot. <laughs> Merlot. That's what I drink at night. Merlot when I go to bed. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's nice and relaxing. Um, usually I save it for the evening, but that's all I really had, so this is what I'm drinking. Yeah, on. let me find out. Let me find out. I drink what two dope chicks drink all the time. <laughs> of course. Kim, what you got? <laughs> are you got I, I just said I, I like a little orange juice with my Tito's, so, you know, it's the perfect breakfast. Just pour a little orange. I'm in a little Tito's in my orange juice, and uh, It's a good you know. smoothie. It's a good smoothie. Like exactly. It. I'm getting my vitamins. <laughs> 
I'm getting my vitamin C and everything. You can't beat that. <laughs> everything. And you got look, and you got a potential a potential COVID-19 vaccine involved with that, alcohol. Exactly, so. exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right, Michael, well, thanks again. We really appreciate you for blessing us with this interview. You have an amazing story, and we are so thankful that you decided to share it with us. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, everybody, thank you guys for watching. Tune in to Two Dope Chicks podcast every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook. And um, until then, you guys have a great week. We appreciate you. And bye.